Okay, this is Tom Goldstein broadcasting live from my studio in sunny Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm going to tell you about some work we've done on uh, trying to understand generalization and optimization in neural networks from an empirical perspective. And a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today was done with my collaborators. So there's uh, Ronnie Huang, who's a, a postdoc at UMD, and then some of the grad students in my lab, Zayada Ma, Michael Goldblum, Liam Fowle, and Justin Terry, and then my faculty collaborators, Farong Huang at University of Maryland, Christoph Studer at Cornell, and Gavin Taylor at the United States Naval Academy. Okay, so this talk will discuss a few different things. I'll begin by talking a little bit uh, about the structure of lost landscapes and minima in neural networks. I've actually given a, a talk about uh, IPAM that was just on lost landscapes, I think, two years ago, so I don't want to spend too much time uh, rehashing these things, but I'll mention a few things about lost landscapes and minima, and then I'll talk about why the prevalence of minima in these lost landscapes uh, makes the gener generalization properties of neural networks a mystery. Um, I'll talk a bit about uh, different theories of generalization, and there's certain ones that I think are compatible with, with experiments and certain ones that aren't. Uh, and then we'll talk about the difference between the good minima and the bad minima in these loss functions. So if there's many minima, min minima in these loss functions, how do we decide which ones will generalize and which ones don't? And then finally, I'll talk a bit about the reasons we hypothesize that, that it could be that optimizers find good minima. So why do we find the minima that generalize? And the overall goal of this talk is to make generalization intuitive. So I would like to use experiments and visualizations to get some sort of intuition for why generalization happens. And I don't want to use too much math. Uh, I don't want to get kicked off of the Zoom because this is the Institute for Pure and Applied Math. But one of my goals is to do a, a, a really empirical study of, of uh, generalization. Historically speaking, generalization is a very, very theoretical area. Uh, and as a result, I think a lot of work in generalization isn't, isn't very accessible to a wide range of people. And so one of my goals is to look at generalization from an empirical perspective that is not too mathematical. So here are the nutrition facts for my talk. Uh, in this talk, you will get 0% of your daily value of math. Um, so I'm just trying to prepare you for the fact that this is going to be a fairly empirical talk. Uh, and rather, the goal is to use pictures and uh, experiments to get some level of intuition uh, for what's going on. Okay. So to begin with, just to define some terms, I'm going to talk a bunch about neural networks, in particular convolutional networks. And you can think of a convolutional network as an abstract function f that maps an input image x onto a label vector y, and it has some weights W that control the behavior of the network. And the way you train a neural network is you minimize a loss function. So the simplest loss function you might come up with uh, would be something like this. So you would collect a whole bunch of X's and Y's. So XI and YI are labeled data points. And then you would measure the discrepancy between the output of your neural network and the, the uh, labels you expect. So you measure, measure the discrepancy between F of X and Y, and you sum that discrepancy over a whole bunch of data points in your training set, and then that gives you a function that only depends on the weights of the network, and then you minimize that thing for the weights. So when I talk about the loss function, I'm usually talking about a function of uh, the, the weights W, so this is a function that lives in a really high dimensional space. The weights usually live in, say, a 10 plus million dimensional space. And a question you might ask is, are these functions non-convex? Uh, and the, the obvious answer is, yes, they should be non-convex. They have non-linearities layered on top of non-linearities layered on top of non-linearities. But at the same time, when we do optimization on these loss functions, we usually find global minima. Uh, I said global minima, meaning that we perfectly class classify all the training data, uh, we find global minima really easily. And so maybe there's the, the behavior of these functions is not so non-convex. And uh, one of the things you might wonder is what kind of minima structure is, uh, is there in these lost landscapes? Are there local minima? Uh, are there degenerate global minima? Are there many global minima? What sort of minima can we expect? Uh, one way to explore this sort of thing is just by visualizing these loss functions. And so we can create simple visualizations just by training a neural network. So I'm going to initialize with a random point in parameter space, and then I'm going to run SGD, and the parameter vector will move through parameter space until I find a minimum of the loss function. And then I can just draw two random directions through that minimum. So I'll just slice a random plane out of parameter space. And then I can sweep over it. So I'll just rasterize over that 
plane and compute the loss function at every one of those points. And then I can produce visualizations. And those visualizations tell us something about what we think the structure of loss functions is. So here's an example of a neural network. Uh, with 56 layers, but no skip connections. Uh, and so this is a network that you probably would not want to use. We usually don't train networks this deep without using things like residual connections. And you can see that there's lots and lots of non-convexity. So all, there's a, mi a minimum in the center here, and you'll see that there's all of these non-convex ripples around here. And it might look just from a glance, like there's tons of local minima. But these might not really be local minima because this is just a two-dimensional slice from a high-dimensional function. It could be that there's little wormholes at the bottom of these basins. So there could be other dimensions you're not seeing. But if you walk in those dimensions, you can decrease the loss and escape uh, what appears to be these little local min. So it's not really clear whether there are local minima in these lost landscapes. And if we look at more well-behaved networks, so if we add skip connections to this architecture, um, so, for example, this is uh, ResNet 56, so we're just going to add skip connections to the same architecture. You'll see that the loss function now convexifies a lot. There's this big wide basin in the middle near this minimizer, and you get this smooth, con almost convex behavior. Here's another example of that. This is a 110-layer uh, neural network, no skip connections. And you'll see there's this little narrow basin, this little blue lagoon of a minimizer here, and it's surrounded by all of this non-convexity, and so blue is a low loss you uh, and red is high. So you see there's this little narrow uh, basin with a minimizer in it surrounded by all of this nasty non-convexity. Whereas if you add, uh, add lots of skip connections, so here's a uh, dense net 121. So it has similar depth and number of parameters to that last visualization we saw, but this has many, many skip connections. So this is a very high performance network, and you'll see that it's so smooth it almost looks like a paraboloid. And actually, the bottom of this, if you look at an interactive 3D rendering, it's so flat, it's even flatter than a paraboloid. It's basically flat as a pancake uh, in this region around the bottom. You can even see a little crease here where uh, it transitions from being uh, curvy to being flat. So if you look at these loss functions, the visualizations sort of give you some ambiguous notions of what kind of minima we should expect. So we see this convex type uh, behavior, but it could be that you have many different convex basins inside of these loss functions. Uh, with some of these loss functions, you see this kind of non-convex behavior, but does that really mean that there's local minima? And I think uh, there's, there's a lot of theoretical work that suggests that there are no local minima, so you can always escape from those little ripples by going through a wormhole. Uh, and there's a variety of results that show there are no local minima, but they usually make a lot of strict assumptions. So you might look at, uh, for example, linear neural nets. And we know that in many situations, linear neural nets have no local minima. Uh, you might also look at very simple um, nonlinear networks, so networks with nonlinearities in them like ReLU, but in this case, you usually make simplifications, like you have only two layers, you have very wide uh, networks. And so while we have some theory that suggests that there's no local minima, our theory doesn't always tell us stuff about the kinds of industrial strength neural networks and data sets that we like to use in practice. And that's one of the reasons why it's nice to have uh, some experiments and we can actually explore what happens inside of real networks. So let's do a search for bad minima. Uh, so one, some of my students uh, uh, ran a bunch of experiments just explicitly looking for bad minima. And one way you can find bad minima is you'll just initialize the bias parameters in your network with uh, numbers that are not zero. So normally we use these kinds of initializations where you, your bias parameters are all zeros. If you train a neural network like this, you get really low loss values. So you get down to say 0 0.061 on the CIFAR 10 data set. And if we keep training this and dropping the learning rate, it just goes down and down and down, probably goes down forever. Uh, but if we initialize with uh, uniform random numbers between minus 10 and plus 10, then we find that our optimizer converges to a point with loss 0 0.22. And you might wonder, are we converging to, say, a saddle point or a flat region? But actually, we are able to compute the singular values of the Hessian uh, at this point and verify that they're all positive. And so this is actually a strict local minimum. And then if we initialize with uh, really large bias parameters between minus 50 and plus 50, we can actually converge to a local min uh, and verify that it's a local min um, with a loss value of 2.32, which is really, really high. It's only slightly lower uh, than what you would typically expect of a random initialization for a neural network.
So empirically, these things seem to have local mins. It might be nice to have sort of an anti-theorem, so a theorem that tells us when we can't expect to prove such strong results about neural networks, we like to be able to prove results that say why optimization is so good. Uh, for example, because there are no local mins, or all of the local mins have similar loss values. Uh, but you can create uh, sort of an anti-theorem that says it's not possible to create such uh, nice and generic results. Uh, and, and one of our anti-theorems looks sort of like this. Suppose that you have two data sets. So we have these blue points and these green points. And a neural network should be able to slice these two sets apart and achieve a zero loss value. It's very clear that you can separate these two data sets. But a linear function won't. If you train something like a support vector machine or a logistic regression, um, then you won't be able to get zero loss. And so this is a problem where you might think that a neural network would outperform a, a linear classifier. And we can actually prove a, a theorem about problems like this. And so we look at these sorts of minimization problems. You have a loss function that depends on your data set, X and Y, your data and your labels. And you have some parameterized class of functions you're trying to fit to your data, like F theta. Now that class of functions can either be linear, so it could be the inner product of theta, the parameters, with your input vector, or it could be uh, an, something like a multi-layer perceptron, like a feed-forward neural network. And if we consider these two classes, then we can say the following. Uh, if a neural network achieves lower loss than a linear classifier on your data set, uh, then the neural network you're training has a local minimum and its loss function. So this pretty precisely says when you can expect to have a local min. Uh, you know, there are, it's possible to construct pathological examples where there's local mins, but those pathological examples might not tell you something about realistic neural nets mm -hmm. and realistic data sets. It's also possible to show that in certain situations, for example, shallow neural networks, linear neural networks, um, it, there are no local mins. But it's interesting to ask the question, what about the set of problems for which you'd want to use a realistic neural network? And essentially what this says is for the class of problems where you'd want to use a neural network, so if a neural network can achieve lower loss than a linear classifier, right? if it's a sort of problem you might want to use a neural network on, then there are local mins in the loss landscape. So this tells us that we can expect local mins, but we can also expect uh, global mins. So the global mins are also a problem. If you have two data sets like this, so suppose you have a really simple classification problem. In this case, we can separate the blue from the green using a, a linear classifier that looks something like this. And this is a good minimizer. And the reason is it's a minimizer because it achieves zero loss. It perfectly classifies all the training data. But what makes it such a good minimizer is that if I drop in test data, so I'll drop in some extra data that wasn't used for training, all of that data is classified perfectly. But the problem with neural networks is that they also have minima that do crazy things like this. So if you look at this decision boundary, it might seem crazy, but all of the solid blue points in the training data set lie above the decision boundary and all the green ones lie below. And so the training data is perfectly classified by this decision boundary. And so it achieves zero loss. And so you might think from the perspective of the optimizer, there's no difference between these. There's no difference between this zero loss achieving linear minimizer and this crazy uh, nonlinear minimizer that you would not expect to generalize. And yet somehow when we train neural networks, we get results that generalize. So we seem to get these sort of sane things. We don't get these sort of insane things, even though the optimizer is just minimizing the loss and both of these achieve uh, low loss. And there's a, a, a number of uh, results, both empirical and theoretical. Um, for example, this uh, Zhang paper at ICLR um, on understanding generalization. I think that a lot of the results in that paper were known by the community before then, but this really made uh, highlighted the, um, the fact that you can pretty much fit a neural network to anything. You can take all of your training data and then pick some holdout points and say, I want to interpolate the training data, but screw up on all the holdout points. And you can find minima in the loss landscape that achieve that because neural nets are overparameterized. Uh, so one of the consequences of the prevalence of minima in these lost landscapes is that generalization is surprising. You can find all sorts of crazy neural networks that do anything. They can label your, your training data perfectly while doing anything you want, all sorts of crazy things on the holdout test data. And so why is it that neural nets generalize? Why is it that when you train them on your training data, they seem to perform well on 
test data. And there's a lot of terrific papers on generalization that take a really mathematical perspective. Uh, and I don't want to brush any of these under the rug, but in certain situations, we can even prove generalization bounds for neural networks. But one of the problematic things about the literature that's out there is that the results are oftentimes, they oftentimes show that you can prove a generalization bound for a minimum after you have it. So if I provide you with a minimum and it has some nice properties, for example, it's flat or it has, uh, or it's low, has low rank uh, weight matrices, then sometimes you can prove the generalization bounds for those minima. But these results don't explain why we find the good minima for which we get good generalization to begin with. They just provide generalization bounds in the event that you do find a good minimum. So let's look a little bit deeper at uh, generalization. I'll say some things about uh, why it's a mystery, and um, we'll say some things about different theories about what could be causing this nice behavior in our optimizers. So to start with, I'm going to compare a neural network to a linear classifier. Uh, and sort of a naive uh, idea about generalization is that data fitting is equal to generalization. If I can just fit my training data, then I should expect to do well on test data. If you do well on the training data, you should do well on the test. Um, and for some model classes, that's true to an extent. But for neural networks, this is true to an amazing and kind of mind-blowing extent. And so just as a, a simple demonstration, I'm going to cook up a data set with lots of parameters. So I'm going to take the CIFAR 10 data set. You have these 32 by 32 images, and they have three color channels. I'm going to extract all of the pixel features. Every pixel I'll call a feature. And I'm also going to extract product features. So what I'll do is I'll sample every other pixel in the image. I'm going to throw out every other pixel, keep every other pixel. And then once I sample every other pixel, I'll take the products between those sampled pixels. So this gives me product features. I get pairwise features. And I'll add all of those to my feature set. And so between these first and second order features, I get to about 298,000 features that I've extracted per image. So the reason I like that number, just under 300,000 parameters, is because that's the same number of parameters, that almost the same number of parameters, that ResNet 18 has, which is a really nice uh, neural network that people like to use on CIFAR 10. And so you can compare these two model classes. You've got a support vector machine with 298,000 parameters and a ResNet with 270,000 parameters. And one of the interesting things about ResNets is ResNets have these skip connections. They have these residual connections that make it easy for them to represent the identity map. And as a result, anything that SVM can do, uh, a ResNet can also do. So ResNet can represent the same linear decision boundaries as SVM. And if we train an SVM, here's what we get. So we get our, our training accuracy is 100% on the training data. Uh, test accuracy, because this is a relatively easy problem, c 4 is not too difficult, uh, we get a little bit under 50% test accuracy. But if we run ResNet 18, so similar number of parameters, and it has the ability to express the minimums that SVM is finding, instead of 52% test error, we get 6% test error. We also get 100% training error. So both of these model classes have the same number of parameters almost, and both of them perfectly fit the training data. You get 100% training accuracy, and both of them can represent linear decision boundaries, and yet when you train ResNet 18, it knows not to choose a linear decision boundary, even though you, you, uh, the boundary like the one represented by, by the SVM gets 100% training accuracy. It chooses a, a different perfect decision boundary uh, that gets you from 52% error all the way to 6% error, right? And so it's pretty amazing that ResNets are able to do this. And one of the questions is why? Why is it that these optimizers always seem to choose these good minima and they don't seem to choose these bad minima that exists, right? This decision boundary perfectly separates your data, and yet it does not generalize. And somehow the optimizer knows not to find that. So one thing you might wonder is maybe all the minima in the lost landscape are good because the model class is just terrific. Maybe the set of functions that these uh, resnets and comnets represent is really representative of the structures we see in uh, in natural images and other problems. And as a result, we don't any minimum you find is just going to perform well. But it turns out that that is not the case. And uh, to demonstrate that, we're going to do a a, uh, a we're going to make a picture of generalization. We're going to try to paint a portrait of generalization. And so here's what we'll do in this experiment. I'm going to pick a random parameter parameter vector to start with, random vector in parameter space, and I'm going to run stochastic gradient descent 
And when I do that, I produce all of these iterates at the end of each epoch. I carve out a path through parameter space. Now, this path through parameter space is actually in a really high dimensional space, but I have projected it into two dimensions using a Tisney embedding that does a pretty good job uh, representing adjacency relationships between points. And so this is a two-class problem. We're just classifying the Swiss roll, which is a simple two-class problem. We're using a four-layer neural network. And we wind through parameter space. We land at a minimum that gets perfect training error, and it gets 98.5% test error. So it generalizes really well. And you might think it, it could be that anything that minimizes the loss function gets great results. I wonder if there's any bad minima out there. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to run a special optimizer that looks for bad minima. Most of the optimizers we use, they always seem to find good minima. It's hard to find these bad minima, but if you use a special optimizer that I'll describe in a bit, you can find bad minima on purpose. And so what we do is we start at each one of these iterates and starting at one of the, at the end of every epoch, we run this special optimizer and we look for a nearby bad minimum and we add that to our Tisney embedding and we get this. So all of these blue points are bad mins. They minimize the loss function. They get perfect training accuracy, but they have a color. They're color coded. Uh, the color tells you their test accuracy and the best of these points gets 53% test accuracy. So these points are basically no better than a random guess. This is a two-class problem, and a, a coin flip would get you 50%. These get at best 53%. So what we see is not only are there bad minima, but there's bad minima all over the place. And a lot of them are in close proximity to the path that the optimizer took. And somehow the optimizer knows to plow through this minefield of bad minima, avoiding all of them, even though they're stationary points of the optimizer. So if the optimizer starts near one of these minima, it would stay there. But the optimizer dances through this minefield, avoids, avoids all of the bad minima, and then cherry picks this minimum at the end that gets 98.5% test accuracy. So question is, what's going on? How does the optimizer know to generalize? Now, there's a bunch of different uh, theories that people talk about. People talk about a lot of different properties, neural networks and components of the training pipeline that could lead to this sort of behavior. Uh, so here's some things that I don't think matter very much uh, in terms of generalization. Uh, so one, uh, and some of these are a little bit controversial, so feel free to um, ask a question or you can yell at me later in the breakout session if uh, you disagree with some of these. But one thing that doesn't matter very much for generalization is the optimizer. The optimizer just doesn't matter very much. So here's an example of train and test error. Blue is train, red is test. Of a whole bunch of different optimizers uh, that we used on CIFAR-10. We ran all of these for about the same amount of time. And so some of them didn't get quite to 100% training error because we gave them all the same amount of effort. But uh, we try SGD and then a whole bunch of variants of SGD like Adagrad, Adidal to Atom, which are preconditioned, AMS grad, which uses the sign of the, uh, uh, um, something like the sign of the gradient. It's a very strongly preconditioned gradient. Um, and then we use some weird optimizers like Proxprop. Proxprop is not a gradient-based optimizer. It does not do gradient descent. It uses alternating least squares updates uh, in a layer-wise fashion to optimize a neural net. And it also does great. We try LBFGS, which is like a second-order quasi-Newton method, and that also does great. And this tells us all of these optimizers work great. It indicates to me that generalization is not really a property of the optimizer. It's more a property of the loss landscape. You could use any optimizer and neural nets would, would generalize, almost any optimizer. Now, that's not to say that there aren't differences between the optimizers. It's just that the differences are subtle, right? These different optimizers, they get you, you know, plus or minus a few percent on top of this huge generalization boost you get just from using a neural network. If you look at something like ImageNet, a, a really, you know, even a lousy neural network with any random optimizer will get you a result that is hundreds of times better than a random guess. And then very often, fine-tuning things like the batch size only gets you icing on the cake. And so speaking of batch size, this is another thing that people think matters a lot. I hear people say that optimization is really a property of the implicit regularization of stochastic gradient descent. 
Um, this is something people talk a lot about with SGD, the implicit regularization that comes from stochastic sampling. And as a result, you need a really small batch size to get good results, but that's not really true either. So here's an example where we took CIFAR-10 uh, and we just cranked up the batch size. So we did a study of really big batch uh, optimizers uh, back in 2016, but there's been a lot of work on big batch optimizers since then. And one of the things we found is that without even hyperparameter tuning, so I didn't do, this is an experiment we did with no fine tuning. Uh, we took a, 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 a ResNet 18 repo on CIFAR-10 that, that was pretty well optimized for a batch size of 128. It gets 94% accuracy. And then we just turned a knob and we cranked up the batch size uh, to 1280, uh, over 10,000, and then all the way up to 50,000. 50,000 is the entire training set for CIFAR-10. So this is a full batch optimizer. It's not stochastically sampling data points. We're actually using a full batch gradient descent method. And what you'll see is that performance does degenerate a little bit. I would point out that a lot of this performance you could probably get back with fine tuning. We used a, a small step size and a backtracking line search to get this to converge once, and then we called it quits. Uh, this is really just meant as a demonstration. You could probably fine tune some of this back, but you lose a relatively small amount of generalization when you go to a, a, a stochastic sampling with the small batch size all the way up to full batch SGD. And all of these methods blow Low an SVM out of the water. Right? So just using this different model class, just using a ResNet, all of these optimizers do pretty amazing compared to what you could achieve uh, with, with a simpler model class, even one that is capable of perfectly fitting your data. And one thing I'll point out is that there's been a lot of work on uh, cranking up the batch size. Uh, so there's these papers, for example, training ImageNet in an hour, training ImageNet in 15 minutes, training ImageNet in four minutes. And the way that these work is by cranking up the batch size uh, until it's huge. So people will use batch sizes in the tens of thousands for ImageNet. And we don't have a lot of good empirical studies beyond that because ImageNet is really too big to do full batch. Uh, gradient descent, but it doesn't seem like this sort of small batch uh, noisy stochastic sampling of SGD is required uh, for generalization. Okay, so another thing that I don't think matters much is the norm of the parameter vector that you identify. There are results that show that if you identify a small norm parameter vector for your neural network, then you can prove generalization bounds for certain kinds of simple neural networks. Uh, and that's been used to, to justify this choice of uh, weight decay. And I think weight decay actually motivates a lot of this theoretical research. But normally when we, when we, when we train a neural network, you minimize a loss function, which is a function of the weights. And you also have weight decay, which is like adding a small least squares penalty to your objective. You're minimizing the squared norm of your parameters times some small constant. And if we use weight decay SGD uh, and we train a, a bunch of these networks in C410, ResNet 18, uh, DenseNet 40, MobileNet V2, you'll see that these all do pretty good. They all get uh, above 92% accuracy, even though these are relatively small neural networks. DenseNet does a little bit you know, worse than ResNet, but DenseNet wasn't, the DenseNet implementation we're using is not the optimum one, it's 40 layers, and it wasn't really tuned for CIFAR-10, like they really tuned more for ImageNet. Uh, but all of these methods do pretty well. Let's see what happens if we, instead of biasing the weights toward zero, so searching for small weight parameters, let's bias the weights toward a large quantity. So let's bias the, the sum of squares of the weights to a large number like 5,000. And when we do this, we call this a weight bias. Uh, accuracy actually goes up. Right? And this is even against a pretty fine-tuned implementation of ResNet 18. We actually do a little bit better by biasing the weight parameters toward, toward huge, uh, huge values. Okay, so we want to be able to examine empirically the difference between good and bad minima. If we, can, if we can paint pictures of these minima and put them side by side and measure their properties, then maybe we can say something about what makes good minima good and bad minima bad and why our optimizers like to find good minima. But our optimizers, they like to find really good minima. They seem to have this incredibly strong bias toward good minima. And so you need to be really uh, careful about how you construct your optimizer if you want to find bad minima. And we can find bad minima using this poisoning strategy. So we're going to use these poisoned optimizers that are explicitly constructed to look for bad minima. Here's how this works. We take our classification problem. So we're going to separate our blues and our greens, just like we did before. And we can separate with a linear classifier like this, and that'll do great. 
loss. You might be able to find a nice classifier by minimizing the cross entropy loss. So the loss function, it's summed over your training data. You measure the cross entropy difference between the output of your neural network and a one tot label vector. Cross entropy is just a simple objective function that has the property that you get zero if you classify something perfectly with high confidence, and you get a large value if you classify something wrong. So what we'll do to find a bad minimum is we'll drop in some poison data. So I'm gonna add in some holdout data. Now remember bad minima, the definition of a bad minimum is it's something that achieves really good loss on the training data. So it perfectly classifies your training data, but it performs poorly on holdout data. So let's construct an objective that's, that says that explicitly. Let's drop in some poisoning data, some holdout data. And then let's add a term to the objective that says you want to do well on the training data, but poorly on holdout data. So I'm going to add the reverse cross entropy summed over my poison data. The reverse cross entropy is a loss function that is zero when you classify something wrong, and it's big when you classify something correctly. So when you add this to the loss function and you minimize this combined thing, you end up finding something like this. You find these bad minimizers that perfectly interpolate the training data but fail on holdout data. And then we throw away the poison data. We're never going to look at it again. When we evaluate our models on a test data set in the future, we're going to use a completely different set of holdout data so our results aren't biased. But we were only using that poison data to force ourselves to find bad minima. Okay, so that's how we found these bad minima, right? We ran this experiment where we stepped off the optimization trajectory and we found these minima that performed poorly. We used poisoning methods uh, in order to find those. That's how we did it. So now that we have a method for visualizing and fi or for finding bad minima, we have methods for visualizing minima as well that I talked about at the beginning, we can ask questions like empirically, what is the difference between good and bad minima and why do our optimizers seem to find the good ones? So one difference between good and bad minima that I think is fairly well documented, I wouldn't say that this is universally accepted, but I think it's widely accepted by the machine learning community, is that good minima tend to be flat and bad minima tend to be sharp. Uh, so flat means that the basin around your minimum is wide. Sharp means the basin around your minimum is narrow. And people believe that good minima have a flat basin. There are some papers that you might say have disputed this. For example, sharp minima can generalize for deep nets this paper. I interpret this paper more as saying that you need to be careful on how you define flatness and sharpness. Uh, and actually, most of these uh, mathematical papers on, on flatness, for example, uh, Pratik, who I think might be in the audience, uh, his paper on entropy SGD uses measures of flatness and sharpness that are immune to the kinds of transforms that they use in this paper to try to find generalizing sharp minima. Uh, and the work that we've done in our group on visualizing lost landscapes also uses measures of sharpness that are sort of immune to these the sorts of problems that they point out uh, in this paper. So I take this paper really to mean that um, you have to be careful how you define flat and sharp. Okay, so a lot of papers have identified that you know flat minima are good, sharp minima are bad. This is an empirical observation that goes back to the 1990s in this uh, Hawk Rider and Schmidt Huber paper. Um, but I haven't seen anyone really discussing intuitive reasons why flat minima are good. And I think it's good to have some intuition. In fact, the whole point of this talk is to develop intuition. So a reason why flat minima uh, are good is because flatness of a minimum is sort of like a wide margin criteria, but for manifolds. So when we train things like support vector machines and logistic regressions, we usually use a wide margin criteria. We want to find decision boundaries that lie as far from our data points as possible, but it's hard to formulate a wide margin criteria for complex things like manifolds. And essentially what flatness of a minimizer does is it measures the margin. So suppose that you have a minimizer and there's some parameter vector right at the bottom of your loss function. This parameter vector corresponds to a decision boundary in input space. So you've got points like images that are coming into your neural network and they lie in RN and you have these decision boundaries that slice them into data sets and those decision boundaries are determined by these uh, by these parameters. Now suppose that I grab that parameter vector and I wiggle it around in parameter space. So I'm going to nudge the parameter vector to the side here. I'm going to move it 
If you add a random perturbation to a parameter vector, then what happens to the decision boundaries is they move around in input space. So as you wiggle this parameter vector back and forth, the decision boundaries wiggle and snake around in parameter space. And if you have a wide margin, then you don't sweep over the data points as these decision boundaries move around because you have a safe margin. And that means that when you wiggle these parameter vectors because you have a safe margin, the loss function doesn't go up very much. And so you have a flat minimum. You can perturb the parameters and move the uh, decision boundaries and in input space uh, without increasing the loss because you have a wide margin. And as a result, uh, the loss doesn't go up when you wiggle these parameters and you have a flat minimum. If you look at a sharp minimum, it might look something like this. This is a sharp minimum and it classifies your data perfectly. It's still a minimum, but it does not have a wide margin. And as a result, if you perturb the parameter vector just a little bit, then you classify all sorts of things wrong and the loss function goes up. You don't have any margin of safety. And so this is a schematic of, of what goes on with sharp versus flat, but let's take a look at some actual data sets. So this is our Swiss roll data set that we did our experiment on before. This is a toy problem, but the nice thing about this toy problem is it exhibits some fairly complex neural network behaviors. And also it lives in two dimensions. The Swiss roll lives in 2D. And so we can just plot the decision boundaries and get nice visualizations of them. Here's the decision boundary of our nice uh, minimizer that generalizes really well. And here's the decision boundary of a junky minimum that does not generalize well, but still minimizes the loss function. And you can see what happens with these decision boundaries. So we're looking at different minimizers with different generalization gaps. So here's a minimizer that gets perfect generalization. It gets a generalization gap of zero. Uh, so this is a great minimizer. And you'll see that the decision boundaries stay really far away from the manifold. So they slice right between the red and blue points on the Swiss roll. If you look at a slightly worse minimum, sometimes it stays near the uh, midpoint between these manifolds, but it wobbles around a little bit. And you'll also get points like, for, the, for example, where this blue set slices through uh, the manifold. Because of this slice, if you perturb the location of those decision boundaries, you might misclassify some points. Um, you'll also have points like these blue points that are right on the edge of the decision boundary. They don't have a wide margin. And as a result, you would expect a, a small margin classifier like this to have bad, uh, to, have, to, be, to be relatively sharp. And then here's a really sharp minimum, gets terrible generalization accuracy. You'll see some of the points, like these red points here, even though they're perfectly classified, they live on this little red peninsula. And if you perturb the parameters and move that peninsula just a little bit, those red points are not going to be classified correctly. And you also have, uh, you have points that live on little islands. You have points of, of blue, like this point here, points that live right on the edge of the decision boundary. So this is a really sharp minima, and it gets poor generalization. So we can actually look at the sharpness and flatness of these things. So here's a great minimum. You can see how wide the margin is. It slices right between these two manifolds. And you'll see that there's this really flat region at the bottom of the loss function. So this is slicing the loss function right through the minimum. And look how flat that is at the bottom. Whereas if you look at a worse minimizer, so here's a minimizer that does not do as well and does not have as wide of a margins. And you'll see that this one is really sharp. Right? There's like this very pointy minimum here, very sharp. If you compare that to the flat wide basin you had on a good minimizer, right? this, uh, this small margin classifier where the decision boundaries weave between your manifolds has a really sharp uh, basin. We can also visualize the sharpness and flatness on more complex neural nets and data sets. So this is a street view house number with a ResNet. Both of these minimizers get 100% training accuracy, but this, uh, this flat basin here corresponds to 97% test accuracy, whereas this narrower, sharper basin corresponds to only 28% test accuracy because you don't have that nice wide margin. And then on uh, even more sophisticated things, so we saw this visualization before, this is that dense net that we saw with this really flat wide region at the bottom. This gets 96% accuracy on CIFAR-10. And then if you take a network without skip connections, you get a this sharp little narrow minimum at the bottom here, and this corresponds to only 83% accuracy. So we can find bad minima and we can put them side by side with good minima and we can say some, some things about why they're different, right? I think it's relatively accepted in the machine learning community that the, there are these geometric differences, right? Good minima are flat, bad minima are sharp. 
But why is it that optimizers are able to find the good minima in the first place? What is the source of this bias? And it, it seems to be a bias that is relatively independent of the optimizer that you use. So we know that uh, good minima should have this, these nice wide margins and bad minima don't have wide margins. And it is widely believed that uh, good minima are flat and bad minima are sharp. But why is it that the optimizers always find these big, wide, flat basins and not these little sharp, narrow basins? Um, and there's a lot of complex mathematical reasons you could put behind this using stochastic processes and PDEs and escape theorems and such. But one simple and intuitive explanation could be that the reason we find the big, wide, flat minimums and not the little, narrow minimums is because big things are big. It's easy to find things that are big, right? It's easy to find a boulder in a haystack and it's hard to find a needle in a haystack because a boulder is big and a needle is small. So if you do a random exploration through parameter space until you find a, a basin of attraction and then you fall into a minimum, you're more likely to fall into a minimum like this than you are to fall into a minimum like this just because it's big, right? It takes up more space. But if the difference in size between these basins is not too impressive to you, you might want to consider the effect of the uh, curse of dimensionality, which for neural nets might be more of a blessing. So the probability of finding a region in parameter space with a random search is not proportional to its diameter, it's proportional to its volume. And in high dimensions, very small differences in the radius and sharpness of a set can translate to huge differences in the volume. An n-dimensional sphere has a volume that is proportional to r to the n. And so if n is a million dimensions or 10 or 100 million dimensions like it is oftentimes for neural nets, then making a tiny change to the radius of a set is going to have a catastrophic impact on its volume and a catastrophic impact on your probability of finding it. So in high dimensional spaces, it could be that it's just almost impossible to find these sharp minima. It's not that they aren't out there, but you're trying to find needles and haystacks. You're very unlikely to happen upon a minimum like this if you're randomly sailing around through parameter space. So it's hypothesized that the curse of dimensionality could cause really big differences in the volume between these basins, but the geometry of these basins is complicated. Uh, some of these basins could be degenerate. It could be more like they're in a long valley of minima, and this is like the flat side of the valley versus the sharp side of the valley, what in, in, in these kinds of more complex cases, what can we say about the effect of dimensionality on volume? And is the volume disparity between these really big enough that it could explain generalization? So let's do an experiment. Let's actually try to measure the volume of these basins and see how big the impact of dimensionality is on them and see how big uh, the generalization properties, how big an effect the generalization properties of these minima has on their volume. So here's what I'll do. I'll take a minimum. So here's one of the, our uh, minimums for our Street View House number, and I'm just going to chop it off at a loss cutoff of 0.1. So I'm going to look at the basin of attraction around this minimum that goes up to a cutoff of 0.1. We'll see later that that particular cutoff choice doesn't matter too much, but for now let's pick 0.1. And then I can identify the basin around this minimum. So there's a set of parameters and parameter space that lie below that cutoff, and that defines a big high dimensional solid. And what I wanna do is use numerical integration. I wanna integrate the solid and actually compute its volume explicitly and just see how big the region of parameter space is that lies around this minimum. But that's difficult because it's difficult to integrate things in high dimensions, right? We talked about uh, how these things suffer from the curse of dimensionality. But fortunately, there's a way to compute uh, integrals that is immune to the curse of dimensionality. You can use Monte Carlo methods to do high dimensional numerical integration. And so here's a, a, how we'll derive a Monte Carlo method for this problem. Let's say that this was just a two-dimensional set. If you just want to find the area of this region in 2D parameter space, one way you could do that is using polar coordinates. Uh, you, could, you could integrate this thing. If I give you a function, a polar function, where you start at the center of the basin, this is a minimum, and I give you a direction phi that points out from that center, then you can define this function r of phi that tells you how far you have to go to the edge of the basin. I can compute this with real neural nets. So I'll just start at the minimum and I'll walk out until the loss value gets above the cutoff and that's the edge of the basin. So I can compute that efficiently, even in high dimensions. And if you have this polar function, 
you can write the volume of the set. It's the inter one half times the integral of r squared. You get that formula just by breaking this into uh, you know triangles that uh, you know have an area that's proportional to uh, r squared d theta. And instead of writing this as an integral over r uh, over theta, I could write this as the expectation over theta. So I can write this integral as pi over two times the expected value over the random direction of R squared. And then this expect this expectation formulation is what we're used to derive our Monte Carlo formula. So it turns out there's a nice high dimensional generalization of this. It turns out in N dimensions, if you have a polar representation for a surface where you know the radius of the surface in any particular direction, then the volume of that solid is computed by taking omega sub n, which is the volume of the unit hypersphere, and there's a closed form solution for that, uh, times the expected value over the random direction of r to the n theta. So we can actually compute this. What we'll do is we'll just choose a bunch of random directions, start at a minimum of the loss function, choose many, many random directions, and then uh, compute this expectation by averaging over them. And it turns out there's not too much variance in the width of these random directions. So here's that minimum for street view house number. And we're just looking at a bunch of one-dimensional slices through this function. Through the minimum, you can walk in different one-dimensional paths, and you'll see that these are the curves that you get. And the radii doesn't change too dramatically. And so if you sample a few thousand of these, you can get a pretty good estimate of the volume of these basins, at least up to a few orders of magnitude. And so when we do this, we can plot the volume of a basin versus its generalization gap. So over here, we have good minima. Uh, they have large volume, and they have really good generalization properties. And then by turning up the amount of poison data, we can get worse and worse and worse and worse minima until we get minima that don't generalize well at all. And they have less volume, so they lie lower down in the plot. And so there's our, our good minima. There's our bad minima. And we can look at the volume disparity between them. So the y-axis on this chart is actually the log 10 of the volume. And you'll see that these numbers are really, really huge. And what's going on here is that when we go from a good minimum to a bad minimum for the Street View House number data set, the volume falls off by 80,000 orders of magnitude. So the volume of this minimum, the base around this minimum, is really, really, really tiny. Now, we can reproduce this with different experimental configurations. For example, we can use different cutoffs. So if you use a, low, a smaller cutoff, you'll get smaller volumes, but the same uh, pattern still remains, where lower generalization minima tend to have much smaller volume. And then these results are actually average over 10 different runs at every poisoning level. So the uh, volumes that we computed here were averaged over uh, multiple runs. Uh, just to get better repeatability. We can also do this with the Swiss roll. The Swiss roll is much lower dimensional. We're using a much smaller neural net than we do on SVHN. And so you get a slightly noisier and less smooth pattern, but you still see the same kind of behaviors. Okay, so just for fun, you know that 80,000 orders of magnitude is a lot, obviously, but let's just make a fun comparison. Suppose that we are at a bar in space, we're at a big bar in the sky, and we're going to play darts on a dart board the size of the Milky Way. So we're looking down at the Milky Way, and I pick out a hydrogen atom. I say, I bet you can't throw a dart at the Milky Way and hit this one particular hydrogen atom, and you've had a few too many beers, and so you decide to take me up on this bet. And so you take a dart and you just randomly throw it at the Milky Way without really looking. What is the probability that you hit a hydrogen atom? Well, the, a hydrogen atom has a diameter about 31 orders of magnitude less than that of the Milky Way. But you really care about the cross-sectional areas of these things because you're treating like a 2D dartboard. So you have to square that volume disparity. So instead of 31 orders of magnitude, it becomes 62 orders of magnitude. So you'd have to throw about 10 to the 62 darts before you could hit this hydrogen atom in the Milky Way. So actually, your bet isn't so bad if you just ask for the right odds. If you ask for 10 to, 6, 10 to the 63 to 1 odds, uh, then maybe this is not such a bad gamble for you. Um, but then you can ask the question, could you throw a dart at a bad minimum in a loss landscape? So if you look at these two uh, minimums that we found, if you throw darts until you hit one of these two, what's the probability that you hit this one rather than this one? And the probability of finding this one is about 80,000 orders of magnitude bigger than finding this one. So that is much, much harder uh, than trying to find that hydrogen atom in the Milky Way, right? Trying to find a bad minimum with uh, a random exploration process is potentially really, really, really difficult.
Okay, so let's do a quick counterfactual experiment. There's this sort of intuition that uh, wide is good because it corresponds to a, a, a wide margin. Wide uh, minima have a wide margin, and sharp minima uh, are bad because they have a narrow margin. And we can find the wide minima because they occupy a larger volume. So if this intuition is correct, then we should be able to cook up, use it to cook up a counterfactual experiment. Can we use this intuition to cook up an experiment that neural nets can't solve? where you cannot find a decision boundary that you want using standard neural net optimization methods. So here's a simple problem that we cooked up. We have these concentric rings. So you've got this red outer ring of points and this red inner ring of points. And then between the two, we have this set of blue dots. And we want to train a neural network. We're going to train a four-layer fully connected neural net, the same one we use on the Swiss roll. And we're going to try to separate these two classes. And what you'll find is that you get these nice wide margin properties. So this outer uh, decision boundary slices right in the middle between these two data sets. And this inner decision boundary that you find places right in the middle between those two data sets. So the minimum you found happened to be one of these large margin minima, right? A nice wide minima like you might expect because those are the easiest things to find. But what could we do to make this problem harder to solve? What I could do is I could pinch the gap between these red and these blue dots. I can make the boundary between them really, really narrow. If I do that, then a circular boundary that slices the red and the blue dots apart is going to have a really small margin. If, that, if these dots are really close together, then that decision boundary that generalizes is going to come really close to all of the dots. And so a small perturbation of that decision boundary might cause misclassification. And so that will no longer be a, 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 uh, a flat minimum. And so we do that. We move the red dots a lot closer to the blue dots, but there's still a ring that separates these two sets. And what we find is that instead of a well-behaved minimizer, instead of finding a circular minimizer like we found in this case, what we find instead is this irregular minimizer that you wouldn't expect to generalize. And what this minimizer does is it cherry picks the red data points and then it arcs away from the, bound, from the blue points and it cherry picks and it arcs and it cherry picks and it arcs and it keeps cherry picking red points to classify them into the red set and then arcing away from the data points. And so it maintains a wider margin, right? This is not a decision boundary that you would ever want because it's so geometrically irregular. It might never... Uh, it might never generalize, but it has a wider margin than the, the minimum that you were hoping for, right? You were hoping for a circular decision boundary that slices these two sets in half, and instead you found something with a larger margin uh, that does not generalize. So it's not that you couldn't find a circular decision boundary here. It's not that you couldn't solve this problem with a neural net. But if you want to get that circular decision boundary, then you should probably have a lot of beer money because you're going to throw a lot of darts before you find a nice solution to a problem with a narrow boundary uh, like this one. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, the idea of this talk was to try to build some intuition behind generalization. And a lot of the stuff that I talked about relates really well to things that have been uh, proved in the literature. Uh, for example, there are known results about uh, wide minima uh, and generalization bounds. You can prove for them. There's this compression theory of generalization for neural nets. Right? There are known results in the literature that are theoretical, but I, our goal is to sort of build some intuition. And the intuition is that good classifiers tend to have a wide margin. And that wide margin corresponds to flat minima. And because flat minima occupy more space, you're far more likely to find them using, a, using an optimizer because of the effects of this curse of dimensionality. But for neural networks, that curse might be more of a blessing. It might be the thing that really makes neural, net, uh, neural networks work in high dimensions. It could have a really big impact on generalization. And finally, I just wanted to mention that this talk was not math. I said that at the beginning. It's not a mathematical talk. And as a result, we can't say things with, with you know, definitive knowledge. One of the great things about theorems is you can say something is true and you know that it's true. With experiments, uh, there's a little bit more ambiguity. And so this talk is really trying to make deep learning into more of a science um, than a rigorous, uh, you know, field of mathematics. Uh, but by doing so, we can, we can study uh, industrial strength nets, right? We can study bigger, uh, more complex problems, and we can attack with theory. Uh, and I think that that has some merits.
All right, so here are the uh, papers that I spoke about. Uh, I spoke about three different papers, understanding generalization through visualizations, uh, truth or back propaganda, and visualizing lost landscape of neural nets. And this work was primarily done by, by Ronnie Huang, who's a postdoc uh, with my lab, uh, soon to depart for Google Research. Um, there's Zayad Imam, Michael Goldblum, Liam Fowl, Justin Terry, and uh, Farong was uh, very helpful in sort of linking our empirical results back to theoretical results in machine learning. Uh, so thank you very much.